all sorts, and it has made it impossible for us to hold our usual annual round of in-person events, and not least the annual meeting and dinner of the Fortescue Society. But for the Fortescue Society on this occasion, as more generally, we're finding the webinar an acceptable substitute, and I hope you find it so. Um, indeed, it has enabled people who wouldn't be able to come to the college or to some other place that we hold an in-person event uh, to be with us. So welcome to this um, annual, <clears throat> excuse me, event of the Fortescue Society. It's always a great pleasure for me to um, introduce the Fortescue Society event um, because law is now and has been for such a very long time, such a very strong subject at Exeter. And in that connection, it's a particular pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Jonathan Herring. I was reading Jonathan's profile on our website, which is a, a refreshingly candid profile. I'm going to have to revise my own, I think. Among other things, he says he writes far too much, which is a very rare thing for an academic to say. I don't think it's true, but anyway, it, it certainly adds interest to the reading of his profile. Uh, Jonathan began his academic life a very long way from Exeter College, that is about 400 yards away in um, Hartford College, Oxford. Um, he did the, uh, after uh, undergraduate study and training as a solicitor, he did the BCL at Oxford, taught at Oxford and Cambridge, and then took up his fellowship at Exeter and subsequently has been uh, promoted to a personal chair. Um, he uh, sometimes great researchers like Jonathan um, are thought to do the minimum by way of teaching that it's certainly not the tr not true in his case. He teaches criminal law, family law, medical law and ethics. He also teaches on the BCL and he supervises lots of doctoral students. And his research has rightly attracted a lot of attention. He disarmingly uh, describes his research as being on quote our family, our friends, our bodies, unquote. Well, it's really hard to say that you're not interested in Jonathan's research. And he's published, whether you think it's far too much or not, as a, a matter of taste, obviously, uh, a lot, um, including at least six substantial books. So Jonathan, um, it's a great pleasure um, to introduce you. Um, and I think you're, I'm going to say a few things beforehand, but. Uh, you're then going to speak to us about law and the relational self. Over to you, Jonathan. You're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see you all, and thank you all very much indeed uh, for coming along. Um, I'm actually on sabbatical this year, so I haven't been using Zoom as much as my colleagues, and I'm not as expert on it. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. I'm going to try and share a, a PowerPoint. So I'm just going to see if I can uh, do that. Let's see if that works. Now I hope, does that, does that work? I hope that works. Yes. Um, so um, I thought I'd start with just uh, a few remarks uh, about law uh, at Exeter. Uh, and certainly this year, there are some uh, interesting and unusual features. Um, first, uh, I think this is the first time we've got four law tutors uh, at uh, Exeter College. Uh, myself, um, I'm on leave and Leila Tan, who's in the top right hand corner, is doing my teaching for me uh, while I'm on leave. Uh, we also have on the uh, bottom left hand corner, Charlotte Elves, who's uh, our recently created post, uh, the Singer Fellowship in Medical Law and Ethics. Uh, which is an early career post designed for someone working in medical law and ethics uh, at the early stages of their career. Uh, and Charlotte's uh, the first holder of that post. Uh, and then uh, my colleague Rachel Taylor uh, in the bottom uh, right hand corner. Um, but perhaps the more distinctive thing, of course, about this uh, academic year has been uh, the teaching. As I said, I've largely been spared it. Uh, this year, um, but it's been wonderful to see uh, the tutors and the students 
um, learning how to use Zoom and uh, other means of teaching uh, uh, effectively. Um, there have certainly been challenges. It's uh, much easier for some students who have uh, strong internet connections and access to uh, rooms and facilities. Uh, but for other students, there have been real challenges to find quiet places to work, uh, to be able to access the material online. Um, and it's great that the college has been able to support some students, those who have uh, needed it um, through various grants. Um, and I know the tutors have been bending over backwards to help students face some of the challenges. Um, Inevitably, there are things that we can't replace. We can't replace the uh, wonderful social life and just getting to know people um, that you can when you're face to face. But again, we're doing our best by getting ways of people uh, mixing together uh, online. Um, and we all look forward to uh, getting back together face to face. Um, law uh, at Exeter is uh, thriving um, and uh, amongst the undergraduate population, we've got many uh, outstanding students um, and it's been wonderful to see uh, the initiatives the college has been making in widening access um, with nearly half uh, of uh, the first year students uh, coming via uh, various access uh, initiatives. Um, but what I wanted just to highlight something that uh, is perhaps easily forgotten uh, are the graduate students uh, at uh, Exeter College. And here are just some of the topics uh, that uh, DPhil law students uh, at Exeter are studying. I won't, won't read them through to you, you can see them. Um, but uh, I'd like to highlight two features. You'll first of all see what uh, an internationally uh, significant set of research is being done by our DPhil students. Uh, from Rwanda to the Lebanon, from uh, the Hong, from Hong Kong uh, to India. Um, and secondly, I'd highlight how these are not sort of pie in the sky, uh, highly abstract pieces of research that you might think are of no uh, use to uh, man or beast. Uh, these are looking at uh, issues of a considerable contemporary significance. Um, the uh, property rights for slum dealers in Rwanda. Uh, how should we respond to image-based uh, sexual abuse? Uh, how can we deal with sexual violence? Uh, th these are the topics which are some of the, the big topics uh, of the day. And so the graduate students uh, at Exeter having um, uh, uh, some of whom have, have done their studies uh, in Exeter as undergraduates, but are now continuing as graduates, doing really important uh, groundbreaking work. Um, I'll be very happy to uh, answer questions and perhaps we can talk a bit more about uh, law uh, at Exeter uh, later on. So I'll move on now to talk about uh, my book, uh, The Law and the Relational Self, which came out um, uh, uh, in 2019. Um, I don't know about your family, but uh, our family enjoys uh, knock knock jokes. Uh, and I think you can tell the age of the children by what knock knock jokes they like best. Uh, for an embarrassing long, embarrass embarrassingly long time, the uh, favourite knock-knock joke in our house was knock-knock, who's there, Europe, Europe who, no, Europe who. Um, uh, I'm glad we've now uh, moved on to that. Um, and uh, certainly the one at lunchtime today was knock-knock, who's there, deja, deja who, deja vu. Mm. Um, but that question, who's there? raises the issue of, well, who are we? Um, how are we to understand the self? Um, and it's a question that uh, is often not asked, certainly not asked by uh, lawyers. Um, and perhaps if anything is more, uh, more often found in, in Eastern thought, um, rather certainly rather than Western legal systems. 
But the law tends to assume a very particular understanding of the self. And indeed, it's it's one that people tend to take for granted. Um, that we know who we are. We are um, uh, our bodies. We are ourselves with our own sets of beliefs. Um, uh, we are individuals. Um, we are um, billiard balls in suits, as I wrote in the uh, blurb for this talk. Um, and the law reflects that, that seeing us as separate individuals uh, is at the heart of our legal system. Um, the names we give to our cases, um, Smith versus Jones, imagines there's one person called Smith and there's one person called Jones. Um, and what we typically do in a legal case is list or weigh up the interests and rights that one party has and weighs those up against the interests and rights that the other party has. And that's such a natural way of doing things for lawyers that perhaps we forget that assumes that what we're dealing with are two separate selves, two peoples whose individual interests can be kept apart. The law also promotes certain kinds of value. For example, autonomy plays a central role uh, in our legal thought. Uh, the idea we should be free to do what we want to do. We should be free to write our own life story, to produce our vision of the good life. Um, uh, unless what we're doing interferes in the rights of others. And uh, that kind of principle, you should be free to do what you want to do unless you're harming someone else, uh, is seen uh, as uh, almost a given. Um, and hence the debates over COVID, for example, are often, uh, are there sufficiently good reasons to stop our individual freedom? But that idea that we should write our own life stories, that we should be free and independent of others, again, assumes a very particular idea of the nature of the self, that we are individual, that we are separate, that we prize our self-sufficiency and our privacy. And many of those legal rights are about keeping people away, um, keeping uh, our own uh, sphere free from interference. Um, and so it's elevating that idea and is based around that idea of a particular understanding uh, of the self. It's well captured, I think, by uh, that idea of uh, this quote I put up here from Isaiah Berlin. I wish my life and decisions to depend upon myself, not on external forces of whatever kind. I wish to be the instrument of my own and not of another man's will. I wish to be a subject, not an object. And to so many people, that seems naturally correct. <laughs> it's deep built within us, I think, that we don't want to be children to be told what to do. We want to live uh, our own separate lives. And that's the model the law is based on. But it's one that I argue uh, in my book is incorrect. And it misunderstands the true nature of the self. So I want to highlight three aspects of the self, which I think are actually more in accord with the reality than this very individualized, self-sufficient, self-achieving model. So the first is the idea of the vulnerable self. Uh, and uh, although um, when I wrote this book, that was seen as a, a somewhat controversial claim. Uh, I think that COVID has rather shown rather powerfully how uh, our vulnerability uh, is part of uh, our inherent human nature. Uh, vulnerability is a universal feature of all of us. We like to imagine we are self-sufficient and we're safe and we can protect ourselves and protect our family. Um, but as COVID has shown, that's not true. Uh, 
human beings are, are vulnerable to all kinds of dangers. Um, now, we often see in political and indeed legal discourse that we identify particular groups of vulnerable people who need to be looked after. So children are vulnerable, they need to be looked after. The elderly are vulnerable, they need to be looked after. But I think that overlooks the fact that we're all vulnerable. We all need to be looked after. So when I made this point at a lecture once, someone put their hand up and says, well, that can't be right. Children, babies need uh, an adult to feed them, whereas adults can feed themselves. To which I said, yes, but where do adults get their food? Adults need someone to provide the food, to transport it, to sell it uh, to them. We're all, in fact, dependent upon others to provide food for ourselves. Our bodies, we tend to imagine as being self-contained uh, and uh, a sort of secure environment. But again, as COVID has shown, um, that's not true. Our bodies are profoundly leaky. Uh, they're profoundly dependent upon other bodies. Of course, in our very beginnings, uh, we were um, uh, born in relationship with uh, our mothers. Um, our emotions, our identity are all conceived through our relations with other people. And that makes us vulnerable. Now, it's true that although we're all universally vulnerable, we are we stand uh, in different positions of vulnerability, as Martha Feynman has put it. So the experience that we have of that vulnerability um, is different. Um, but I would argue that's not because we're different in our nature. It's that society has arranged things to meet the needs of some and not the needs of others. So it's the way society is arranged that means that some people uh, appear well equipped, well arranged to be able to uh, overcome their vulnerabilities and other people's vulnerabilities uh, are more visible. Vulnerability is normally seen as being a bad thing, um, but in a different uh, book I've recently uh, co-written, uh, we've argued that vulnerability in fact is really good. It's great to be vulnerable. Because being vulnerable means you have to reach out to others and others have to reach out to you. It recognises that we can't do things together. We can't be self-sufficient. Um, we can't solve the challenges we face on our own. We like to imagine ourselves, as I was saying earlier, as being sort of like James Bond or um, Jack Bauer riding off uh, on our own, able to defeat every enemy. But that's not the reality. Again, as COVID has shown us so powerfully, we need to find interactive, cooperative solutions. Um, so we have to set aside our image of our self-sufficient, strong uh, identity and recognize we're vulnerable and all dependent upon others. The second aspect of the self, so the first was the vulnerable self, it's the caring self. Um, and care is essential to our well-being. Because we're vulnerable, we need each other's care. Um, and um, as uh, I often say to my students, um, if we had uh, a week when no accountancy or even, dare I say it, no law was allowed, um, that would be OK. We'd survive. We could uh, uh, um, live with that. But if there was no care for a week, well, then the death toll would be considerable. So care is a central aspect of our humanity. It's one of the things that we have to have. But once we move to looking at relationships of care, then we realise this image of individual selves starts to break down. Because in relationships of care, our interests become intermingled. Um, to harm a caregiver is to harm a person cared for. And any parent knows that. Um, and again, we've seen this in COVID. If a parent, if so, if, if a parent is ill or if a child is ill, that affects the parent or child. 
um, that we can't separate out um, what's bad for you and what's bad for me in relationships of care. And so this leads to the idea of the relational self, that who we are is actually found from our relationships with others. Um, that if you ask people who they are, in fact, they very often define themselves in relational terms. I am this person's child. I am this person's brother or sister. Uh, I am this person's parent. Um, I belong to this religious group. I support this football team. Um, I am a member of this college. Um, we see ourselves and understand ourselves through our relationships. The things that give us the most uh, value in our lives are love and care. Um, there's where we really find true health and happiness. And so with the law promoting values such as autonomy and privacy and in independence, is missing out on the things that really matter the most, which are our relationships with other people, and particularly uh, our relationships marked by love and care. So rather than the law asking uh, what solution will best protect the rights of this person, or what uh, order will best promote the, the um, individual interests of this person, we should be asking, well, what legal intervention will do the best in promoting caring relationships? And that revolves a fundamentally different way of looking at cases. It's not about promoting individual interests. It's about promoting care and promoting caring relationships. What interventions will enable people to meet their caring responsibilities? And it also, I think, uh, gives us a new uh, image of what it means to be healthy. And I've, I've just added this because, of course, we're thinking about health so much with the COVID pandemic. The traditional image of health is to see it as an individual thing. The individual before the patient, the doctor will take the blood pressure, uh, will check their BMI, uh, test their blood uh, and decide whether they're healthy on those bases. Um, but that, I think, is a very narrow understanding of health. Uh, as I've written here, Robinson Crusoe, living on his desert island, uh, would have been disease free, would have had the most wonderful physique and a BMI to die for. But he was lonely and he lacked human interaction. He was healthy in only the narrowest sense. And if we want to build health, I think we have to build healthy communities. We have to build healthy relationships. It's there where true health is found. And again, COVID is that, has taught us that so strongly. We might be healthy individuals, but if we're in a diseased society or not able to interact with others, we are healthy in only the narrowest sense of the word. So I want, having just given you that, that broad overview, just to talk a little bit about some issues where I think uh, these insights might be particularly significant, some particular legal issues um, that uh, we can address. And the first is the topic of domestic abuse, which again has been rising dramatically during the pandemic. Uh, in the past, domestic abuse was understood as being a sort of private matter, not really of interest to the state, nothing like as important or as serious as a fight uh, in the street. Of course, no one will claim that now, and it's now recognised that uh, punching someone in a house is as serious as punching someone in the street. But I think our understanding of the relational self can take us into an even deeper appreciation of the wrong of domestic abuse um, in two ways. Um, first of all, if it is our relationships 
and our relationships of care, which give our lives meaning, which form our identity, then the misuse of those relationships is a very particular evil. It's turning something that should be giving our lives value and meaning as an attack against uh, the individual. Uh, those relationships in which uh, they are meant to be receiving care are turned against them as a tool of abuse. And that's why there's a very distinctive wrong in domestic abuse, which in some ways uh, is more serious than perhaps an attack by a stranger. But secondly, it highlights that domestic abuse is best understood as a relational wrong. So it's not uh, to describe domestic abuse as person A hit person B on Monday the 17th of July and then uh, emotionally abused them on in uh, August the, uh, later that year, that describing it as a, as a series of separate incidents overlooks the relational nature of domestic abuse. And that's why uh, I very much welcome the recent legal innovations to understand domestic abuse as being about coercive control, uh, a relationship within which one person seeks to come to dominate the other through a vast range of tactics, uh, the evidence uh, suggests, uh, that we can't use our normal legal tools and particularly our normal criminal tools. Um, our normal criminal tools see an ins a crime as being a crime of an assault on a particular day at a particular time. Uh, a photograph approach, uh, I've described it. Whereas to properly understand domestic abuse, we can't just separate the incidents out. It's one incident building on the next, building on another, being reinforced by yet another. And so we need to look at it over time, uh, the combination of a series of incidents that might individually seem small, but combined together, create a program of domestic abuse. Secondly, uh, the issue of mental capacity. And I think the relational self teaches us a number of issues here. Um, mental capacity law, which I know some of you know, know very, very well, but uh, those who not, it's a, it's a growth area of the law, particularly the Court of Protection. Um, and if you're familiar with the Mental Capacity Act, uh, you'll know uh, the Act appears to draw a fairly sharp distinction between those who have capacity and those who lack capacity. If you have capacity, you're free to make your decisions for yourself. If you lack capacity, then decisions are made for you based on an assessment of your best interests. Um, I think the relational self has a number of interesting things to say about mental capacity. First of all, it certainly poses a challenge to mental capacity assessments. So normally in a mental capacity assessment, the doctor will sit an individual before them and ask them a series of questions. Uh, traditionally, who is the prime minister? Um, but I think we've moved on to far more sophisticated forms of testing than that. Um, but it's still a testing of an individual on their own and their ability to think through and answer problems on their own. Or if they're faced with making a medical decision, for example, uh, sitting before the consultant, can they understand what the consultant is saying to them? But what the relational self will tell us is that people don't make decisions on their own. Uh, we make decisions discussing things with other people talking with our friends. Uh, much of the writing on mental capacity has been undertaken by philosophers. Um, and I think their image of the ideal decision maker is the philosopher sitting in his study, uh, contemplating uh, the complexities of the question. Where actually, for most people, making a decision is about sitting down with a friend and a cup of tea chatting through the issues, listening to different people's point of view. 
So our very individual assessments of mental capacity, can this person understand the issues sitting before the consultant, is I think a rather misleading assessment of mental capacity. A second issue which I think uh, is of significance is that mental capacity is, a, um, if, if someone lacks mental capacity, a decision is made based on what is in their best interests. And in fact, the Act makes it clear that the interests of others are not to be taken into account at all. You just consider what's best for the particular child. Uh, sorry, but best for the particular adult who, who, who lacks mental capacity. Um, now that to me is uh, a, a, a very unfortunate provision. Um, first of all, I don't think we can understand our own interests separate from those that we are in relationship with. Um, what happens to uh, someone who lacks capacities relatives really matters to them. And I don't think any of us, if we were to lose mental capacity, would want our decisions made entirely based on what was good for us, with no attention being paid to our family or those caring for us? Would we really want a decision made that would slightly benefit us, but hugely harm our family and carers? Uh, no, we'd want a reasonable balance between our interests and those who are caring for us. So I think in assessments of best interests, we need a much more relationally sensitive approach. Um, what's going to produce the best relationship of care between these people? It may be in a particular situation, a case will slightly, a decision will slightly harm uh, the individual concerned, but it might hugely benefit uh, the family and make the care much easier, producing a more healthy relationship overall. Next, um, parenthood. And here are a few thoughts um, I have on the idea of parenthood. Um, now, parenthood uh, is often imagined as a child who is vulnerable and weak uh, and needs a parent uh, to make decisions uh, on their behalf. Uh, the law on parenthood is, of course, is governed by parental responsibility. Uh, where parents are required uh, or uh, have the responsibility to make decisions for children. In Section 1 of the Children Act, we're told decisions must be made based on what is best uh, for the child. Um, but I make two points about that. The first is similar to the one I made with mental capacity. This assumes that what um, we can separate the interests of the child from the interests of the parent. Um, but as I've already said, I don't think we can. We can't um, uh, imagine the child's interests as somehow separate from those of the parent. But secondly, and perhaps more interestingly, um, I think there's a false dichotomy there between uh, the adulthood being the expert adults uh, and children. Um, we adults perhaps need to learn from children. Um, if as parents we're seeking to impose upon children what we think is best for them, we're forgetting that parenthood should be a two-way relationship. Children should be changing their parents uh, just as parents are changing their children. Uh, in this day of hyper-parenting, helicopter parenting, where parents seek to control every element of their children's lives, perhaps even trying to mould their children into uh, the ideal child for them, um, that's fatally flawed. Um, perhaps we think, uh, as parents, we know too much. But part of parenthood should be learning from children being cared for by children. Um, I remember uh, one uh, time I was asked to give some closing remarks on, um, the, uh, on childhood. And I closed the, uh, the seminar by listing the ways my children had looked after me that morning. 
Um, and I think as parents, it's easy to overlook the way that actually children care for their parents, just as parents care for their children. And that's a good, good thing. So we need to move away, I think, from a very much parents know it all and parents teach their children and parents care for their children and be much more open and acknowledging of the way that children care for their parents and that children uh, can teach their parents a lot too. So let me just close with this thought, uh, perhaps appropriate for uh, the times of COVID, um, that our health uh, is really found in our togetherness. Uh, it's not in the scalpel of the surgeon or the pill of the pharmacist or the loneliness of isolation, but rather it's in the touch of the lover, the smile of the child and the petals of a tulip. But we need to rethink our law around what actually is valuable and good in our society. And that's not in our individual rights or in our autonomy or in our freedom, but in our relationships of care with other people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that very simulating and accessible talk. We now have the uh, opportunity for questions and answers. I think you're getting an echo of my voice at the moment. I apologize for that. Um, the uh, way in which uh, you should signal that you'd like to ask a question is to use the raise hands facility here on um, Microsoft Teams, and that's in the toolbar in the upper right hand uh, part of your screen. And if you'll just click on that, then that will call my attention to the fact that you'd like to ask a question. So is there someone who would like to um, ask the first question? Uh, Patrick Gartland. Please unmute yourself and then uh, you can ask your question. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Hi, Jonathan. I'm curious what you think about uh, relationality when it comes to punishment and rehabilitation. Whenever we sentence someone for uh, to a fine, for example, that's a very individualistic way of looking at it. It's compensating another person as an individual. But even more so when we look at imprisonment, that's relationally speaking, it sounds like that's a very brutal way of dealing with it because that's cutting off all of that uh, criminal's connections with the people that they're related with. And then down the line again, when it comes to, for example, a parole review, they'll be looked very harshly depending on the way that they've chosen to make, uh, take whatever they can from the forced relationships that they're given in prison. You're associating with negative peers, but who else can you associate with? I'm wondering what your thoughts are on relationality in that sort of arena. Hi, Patrick. Great to, great to see you. And that's a, a fantastic question. Um, so I think I'd make, make two points. So one is um, that although I've talked a lot about relationships, sometimes the right legal intervention might be to ensure the parties don't see each other again. That, that might be what gives someone the most freedom to enter into relationships with others and care. Um, so sometimes intervention will be to keep people together, but it, but it might be to keep people apart. Um, but I think you're right at the imprisonment, going really to the, the nub of your question, imprisonment seems to be uh, profoundly anti-relational. Uh, it cuts off the prisoner often from their family and their friends. Um, now, I think there, there probably does need to be a place for uh, imprisonment, sometimes for public safety at least. But what I think we're really bad at doing is enabling relationships to continue for prisoners. Uh, and the way that prisoners are cut off from their families uh, is uh, a, a real loss and I, I think not a way to, to produce um, rehabilitation. And of course, there will be some crimes where I think um, uh, rehabilitative uh, approaches to crime, finding where there are ways to restore the relationship between the criminal and the victim might, might work and might be an appropriate intervention, although I think they have to be treated with some care. 
Um, but uh, those are certainly worth looking at in, in some instances. OK, I'd like to turn now to Jörn Müller. We can't hear you at the moment. No. No, unfortunately. Still can't hear you. <laughs> Perhaps you could put something in the chat. Do we have another questioner coming forward? Well, Jürgen puts his... Um, Marta Gutzman. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, for your paper, Jonathan. That was great. I was uh, wondering, and I, I know we have talked a bit about this before, um, that if um, but being hit on the street or in the streets versus being hit by by a family member or a partner might be considered worse, um, or or maybe a different wrong, um, and possibly the law and course of control might remedy some of the of the photo photo uh, approach of, of the law whether well the first part of the question is whether you think that the law of course on course of control actually does remedy that to some extent and if it does whether that's something that could be uh, an approach that might be used in other areas of the law as well yeah so i think um one of the difficulties with the the criminal law generally is we take this sort of photograph approach that will we see uh, we reduce the wrong done to a particular moment at a particular time uh, and describe the impact as uh, a particular harm to someone's body. So um, they were bruised by being punched uh, on this particular afternoon in question. Um, and in some, there might be some instances where that where that is it, that, that, that is pretty much a description of all that has that has taken place. Um, but in many circumstances, I think that's that's a very narrow picture of the true harm that's being done. Um, and you're right, I think there are lots of uh, crimes, um, things like um, cyberbullying, uh, of course, uh, stalking, harassment, image-based sexual abuse, which you're working on, um, uh, those sorts of crimes, um, they can only really be understood by taking this uh, much broader uh, perspective in relation to time, and only then can the true wrong be appreciated. I turn to Hugh Beale. Thank you, Rector. Jonathan, thank you. That was fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading the book. I wonder if I could go back to the first part when you were talking about vulnerability and our responsible responsibility for vulnerable people because i think at the moment once you move outside the realm of parents and children we tend to think that if somebody is suffering for a misfortune that's not the responsibility of any other individual that's something where the state has to come in and you seem to be hinting that you would like to see a major shift in that now of course the common law is particularly individualistic. I mean, if we look at, say, German law or French law, there's much more responsibility for taking care of, I don't know, people who, children who fall into a paddling pool, you have a duty to, to rescue, which we don't recognize in English law. And there are some, some legal systems which require children to look after their elderly parents, which we don't do. But I don't know of any legal, Western legal system that actually puts a legal obligation on anybody to help somebody else just because they're vulnerable and in trouble. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just sure, not sure what you're actually wanting to do. I think we recognize a moral obligation, but I think for a long time we've said that the law and morality are not congruent. We don't necessarily want legal intervention to force me to do something which most of us think I'm under a moral obligation. Thank you, Hugh. That's a, a fantastic question. Um, and you're absolutely right. So the, the, pro the proposal I'm making is that we should be asking what form of legal intervention 
will best promote a caring relationship. Um, so um, I've, I've, I wrote an article once on whether or not uh, adult children should be required to visit or um, look after their elderly parents. Um, and I don't think that would be a good idea. <laughs> I think compelling adult children to visit their parents through threat of a criminal sanction uh, will uh, have adverse effects, actually won't create a caring relationship because uh, the older person might feel, well, my children are only visiting me because they have to. Uh, and it might stifle uh, any, uh, uh, any good. Um, and similarly, I, I was asked once to lecture on how the law could compel nurses to be compassionate. And I said, well, that's actually awful. The idea of compelled compassion <laughs> uh, would be the last thing you might want as, as a patient, that someone was being compassionate to you because they were complying with some regulations. Um, and so I don't think that I, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not arguing in favour of compelling uh, what will be caring relationships, but I am asking for a legal structure that will uh, support uh, and enable those relationships to take place. Jörn, would you like to have another go? We still can't hear you, unfortunately. If you use the, the chat facility that's up in the upper right hand corner, it's the second icon from the left, you should be able to put a question in there and then I can voice it for you slightly later. I'm sorry. Um, David Fellows. Hi, um, thank you very much for your, uh, for your talk. I guess in a similar vein to Mr. Beale's question, um, I was wondering if you start looking at the law from a less individualistic uh, perspective, would you say or would you agree that it could increase the danger of the executive trying to acquire more and more powers or interfere more and more with autonomy under the guise of uh, kind of mutual vulnerability and thinking about the law in a relational manner? That's um, a great question, David. Um, and, and, and you're right. That's the danger sort of with some of the arguments I'm making that if we say, well, look, we're all vulnerable uh, and as I've also argued, I haven't really talked about it much today, that, that we're all of impaired capacity. Well, at, at first sight, that looks like I'm saying, therefore, the government can step in and regulate all our lives. Um, but I don't think it does, because if we're all vulnerable, if we're all ignorant and uh, of limited capacity, uh, that includes the politicians and the government as well. Um, and so if we recognise uh, that actually lawyers and judges and the government and politicians are as equally vulnerable and flawed in their decision-making capacity as anybody else. I think that actually is a, a bulwark uh, against that kind of heavy intervention, which would, would be concerning. But I, I do accept that's a, a very legitimate concern with my approach. and it's, it's a danger that it could be easily open to misuse. And I do have to accept that. Gregory Hill. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Jonathan, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, you know me for a fully paid up member of the dinosaur tendency. <laughs> so can I put this to you? Uh, is it actually realistic to, to say there's a considerable overlap between autonomous law and relationship law, as you're putting forward, uh, I would put, put two things uh, towards that. Uh, first of all, at the very beginning of your talk, you talked about the litigious form of law, but transactional law is important, is probably more important than litigious law. More transactions go right than go wrong. And having that facility in place enables voluntary relationships to be put in place, worked through, uh, and that is important. Second point, that people who are having difficulty, particularly as one of the earlier questions said, difficulty with the state uh, in making their relationships, 
uh, are actually get the first layer of protection and probably the easiest layer of protection for the law to supply by protecting their individual rights uh, to do things that the state doesn't want, isn't going to interfere with. I, it seems to me the, the Rohingyas and the Uyghurs could do could do with a bit of habeas corpus and a bit of Article 1 of Protocol 1 at the mm -hmm. moment. And there is therefore an overlap between the, the two types of law you, you describe. Thank you, Gregory, and great, great to uh, uh, hear you and uh, to hear your question. I'd, I'd expect nothing less from you. Um, and, and that's a really important point, I think, the first one you made, that, that there are areas of law which, which we can see as uh, promoting relationships. So, you know, marriage law, for example, or, or contract or um, um, and, and so many other examples where the law can provide uh, a background and protection. Um, so I hope I didn't suggest that the, the, the current law is entirely non-relational um, and, and there are things that it can do to, uh, that it does that, that, that prom to promote relationships. Um, and, 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 and it's those that we should be, uh, should be building on. Um, and on your, on your second, um, yes, you're, 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 quite, you're quite right that there are some of the protections um, of autonomy um, that are important, but I think what I would be arguing is we need to ask why they're important. Um, and so, yes, a degree of protection is important, of autonomy is important, so that we can enter into relationships and have good caring relationships. And those need to be free from uh, interference. Um, so there is a, a role for um, individual choice, the goodness of the choice is in producing the relationships, not in the freedom uh, of the autonomy itself. Thank you. Colin Joseph. Uh, it, yes, uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, it's a very, very long time since I was a law student, but I think that one of the uh, first things I learned uh, about our system, certainly our court system, is that uh, contrary to, say, continental systems, it's an adversarial uh, uh, system. Doesn't that itself uh, create an obstacle to achieving what what you would like to achieve as far as, far as the relational law is concerned? Uh, absolutely. So I, 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 I'd be very much in favour of developing, uh, with quite some modifications and protections, but more mediation uh, as uh, as a route uh, to, to to progress. Alternative dispute resolution, um, as uh, often a way of mending and rebuilding a relationship which can be uh, eff effective. Um, we have to be careful. It's very easy for mediation to become a tool of uh, abuse by uh, a stronger uh, party over a weaker one, uh, but properly managed, um, it, can, uh, it can be effective. So it would require quite significant rethinking about how we go about resolving disputes. Virginia Ontiveros. Hi, thank you. Um, Professor Herring, I have a question about decision making for those who are mentally incapacitated. Earlier, you mentioned that care would require the consideration of both individuals' self-interest and their family self-interest. And I was wondering how we can consider the mandate of care in circumstances in which a person doesn't have conventional or nuclear relationships, such as the homeless. What relationships do we, what relationships, relationships do they have and how do we incorporate care into lawmaking? Right. So I think there was, um, there's, uh, uh, that's a great question, Virginia. Thank you. There's, there's a re really good book that was recently written by Kimberly Brownlee, um, who is suggesting a new kind of human right, uh, a human right of association, uh, which she sees as designed to combat loneliness. Um, and she argues that people being deprived of the ability to associate with others should be recognized as a human rights violation like being denied food or water. Um, and I think that that kind of thinking, which I'll be very sympathetic with, with, might be a response to a situation of people like the homeless, that we need to be 
um, uh, to to, to um, provide ways in which they can develop uh, relationships and friendships which can offer um, support. Thank you. Patrick Eccles. Uh, Professor Herring, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, Hello, Patrick. You, you are arguing for some form of new legal structures on the basis that our present legal structures, of which I was once part, are, are not fit for the purpose or the purpose that you would like them to serve. Nobody, I imagine, disputes the social, economic, cultural values that you attach significance to. Uh, my argument would be that the present legal structures are showing themselves capable of adapting to the values which social groups now wish to be promoted. You've given one example by way of coercive control, changes in law, say, relating to provocation, loss of control, have changed enormously because of the value put on particular relationships as they are now understood. My concern is who is going to address uh, the importance to be given to particular relational values if it's not through present legal structures other than some form of paternalistic overlord, the wise platonic man. I don't hmm. see what the structure could be. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm, I'm, that, that's a very legitimate challenge. Um, so I'm not, I'm not seeking to argue that we don't want any law. <laughs> um, I said, certainly want law, and I think the law has, has important roles to play. Um, and I also accept that there are ways in which the law is, is progressing. And there's uh, examples we've already seen in this discussion of, uh, of, of how the law is, is working better to promote relational values. Um, so perhaps I, was, I, I didn't mean to give the impression I wanted there, there to be no law, but it to be a law which has a particular focus uh, and uh, has an especial valuing of the importance of relationships of care. Um, whereas I think too often uh, those relationships of care get, get ignored. Um, I, think, I think we can we can see that just as we look at the kind of cases. I mean, I, I remember as an undergraduate, um, I, there were no cases I studied which involved somebody with dementia. Uh, there were virtually no cases I studied with someone with a disability. Um, I only came across children when I studied family law. Um, so the way we teach law and the way law tends to be presented uh, is often around promoting interests of business uh, uh, and um, uh, human rights, uh, sort of individual human rights, um, rather than looking at uh, these caring relationships, which are key to human well-being, but rarely appear in the courts or only in particular kinds of courts, like the Court of Protection. Can I just ask whether the difficulties that this engenders are enormous. Um, for example, you recently in the Supreme Court, uh, a case on um, habitual residence of children in which um, uh, at least two or maybe three um, expressed the view that the interest of an adolescent child uh, should be given particular significance in deciding whether that child is integrated in one society or not, without deciding what an adolescent child is in legal terms. Now, surely once you start identifying areas of relationship, ultimately you have to come down to very strict legal rights. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that does necessarily follow. Um, and, and certainly you can see in the family courts uh, an example of where their formal legal rules actually in day-to-day -day practice don't play a huge role. Family law is often about saying, well, how on earth can we get these people to continue some kind of a decent relationship? How can we have the child, uh, if it's appropriate, maintaining a relationship with both parents? And that's not going to be rules that are laid upon high. It's going to be trying to get to know the individual child, the individual parents, the family history, and fashioning a unique solution which will work for that particular family. 
Um, and so I think I would rather move away from our traditional image of being law, being an inflexible set of strict regulations to one being more around guiding principles. Thank you. Uh, Jörn, do you want to have another go? I will try. Is it now working? Yes, Yay! it is. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Excellent. I am very intrigued by this by this talk, and it was very very interesting because um, I'm a I'm a family court judge actually in Germany, um, and I've been doing this now for seven or eight years, um, and I can only reinforce some of the things just said by by you, um, um, Jonathan Herring, um, about because. Um, for example, uh, the the way children are treated by the law, uh, thankfully it has evolved, but I can tell you about numerous cases where the children are actually the more, um, more aware of what is going on in their families than the parents who are deep in the conflict and deep, uh, deeply entrenched in fighting each other uh, whereas the children sometimes have a clear view or a clearer view of what is actually going on. However, um, I'm not so sure. I, I think that looking at these um, issues in terms of relations is certainly a benefit. Um, and it is, but, but I am not entirely sure, um, at least here in Germany, um, whether this is uh such um such an entirely uh, new approach because if you look at what um, for example i am doing in my day-to-day -day work um is actually what you just described in the end namely working in an individual family trying to sort out the relations between uh, the different players and it sometimes even extends to grandparents and and aunts and uncles um, and you try to um, um, sort of uh, the web between them, the, 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 the rela relationships between them, how, how it plays out. And I think that um, the law has improved a lot, for example, um, by not having a paternalistic approach necessarily anymore. Um, but this has all been done, and this is now com this comes to the core of my question, so far, it has all been done um, as a rights-based approach. For example, um, the idea that the, the that children have a right to being cared for um, is done by looking at the right of the child um, and not so much by looking at the relationship. And I would be interested in how exactly differs your approach in this respect um, from the so far rights based approach, which is usually um, I, I don't see I, I try to see the difference between balancing rights between individuals that are in a relationship, whereas looking at the relationship as such, if you could elaborate on this a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jorn. That's an excellent question. I, I think I give a, a, an hour's lecture normally to my undergraduates on, on that sort of theme. Um, very, very briefly, um, I'd, I'd agree with you. I don't think there's a contrast between rights and the relational approach, because when we say a rights-based approach, well, it all depends on what values the rights are promoting. Um, so you can use a rights-based language to adopt a relational approach. Um, that uh, you, so the right to family life is an obvious example of where actually, although it's put in terms of rights, it's about relationships. Um, so if our focus is on the values underpinning the rights, or indeed the values underpinning the welfare of the child, whatever language you use, it's those that matter, not the the terminology of rights or welfare that we use. OK, uh, we're coming up uh, right against our time. We have one question in the chat and uh, the Fortescue Society, of course, is alumni, but also students. So I think it's it's good that we come back to a student uh, for the final question. And this is a supplementary question from David Fellows, which is put in the chat. 
and he, he wants to ask you more, Jonathan, about the bulwark you mentioned regarding the shared ignorance and vulnerability, not only of the people, but also of the politicians and the judiciary. What's your view on the danger of a lack of culpability, where due to the shared ignorance, those in power are perhaps given the opportunity to distance themselves from being held responsible for their misdemeanors? Well, and I think that the, the reference to those who are in power is, is really important. So I think this is one of the main messages of this idea of universal vulnerability. Um, is that there are some who do very well in our society and have a lot of power, uh, and that, but that's not because, uh, and, and sorry, and then that there are others who do, do very, very badly and are in a very bad position. Um, and it's easy to say, well, that's those who are in a bad position is their fault. Uh, it's their lack of abilities. They've got problems. Um, rather than realizing it's the allocation of societal resources that decides who is privileged and who is disadvantaged. So I think with that in mind, those who have the power have been given a particular privilege and benefit by society by being put in that position. They've gained a lot from it and so therefore deserve to be held even more accountable. Right. Well, Jonathan, we've, we've kept you on the go for an hour um, and um, uh, it's been very fruitful, but it's time now, I think, to bring things to a conclusion. And I'd like to do so by uh, providing some thanks on behalf of the college. First of all, to everyone who attended, I think the Fortescue Society has admirably set a record so far for the Exeter webinar series in terms of the number of uh, questions and certainly the quality has been very high as well. So thank you all for attending and for those of you who asked questions, um, special thanks. Secondly, I'd like to thank my uh, colleague, uh, Amelia Cross, uh, from our, uh, who's our alumni relations uh, and events person. And uh, uh, Amelia has held this whole event together, uh, both in terms of organizing it and superintending the uh, technical side of things. So yet again, Amelia, thank you very much. Uh, but of course, I want to come back in the end to um, thank, uh, on behalf of everyone, to thank uh, Jonathan uh, very much. Um, it's a wonderfully clear talk, I thought, even to somebody like me who really knows basically nothing about the law, but also very nuanced and uh, profound with a wide ranging uh, implications. One disadvantage of a webinar compared to our usual Fortescue Society event is, of course, we're not providing you with any uh, the those attending with any actual nourishment, either uh, solid or liquid. But I, I think you would agree that we've had a, a, a wonderful substitute for physical nourishment this evening in terms of the uh, very rich intellectual fare uh, that Jonathan has provided a great tribute to him and more broadly to this uh, wonderful uh, law community at, at Exeter College. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks to everyone and good evening.